This episode is sponsored by Grow Therapy. Grow Therapy was founded on the belief that quality mental health care should be accessible. It makes finding an in-network therapist easy. Go to growtherapy.com to find your match and let insurance pay for your therapy. Welcome to a place where you'll leave feeling whole. The Counseling Podcast brings at-home counseling right to you, focusing on self-care, self-expression, and breaking down barriers. Dr. Jacqueline and Dr. Stokes bring over 20 years of combined experience and a new sense of style to the word counseling. The two use humor and lighthearted conversation to explore these deeper feelings. Let's take the stigma away from counseling together. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Counseling Podcast. I am Dr. Jacqueline. And I'm Dr. Jeremiah Stokes. And I want to welcome our colleague and friend, Terry Mattingly, who is our guest today. Terry is a licensed school psychologist uh, by trade. However, she also provides uh, a great deal of forensic mental health services. And Terry, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Terry, tell us a little bit about uh, what you do. Um, well, I started um, off as actually as a um, elementary school teacher uh, 25 years ago. Um, and then I went back to graduate school and became a school psychologist. I worked for the public school system for just a couple of years. And then I started my private practice. I've been doing private practice for about 20 years. Um, about half my practice is related to um, school psychology um, issues. So evaluation, psychoeducational evaluations for things like ADHD, um, different types of learning disabilities, a child perhaps that's on the autism spectrum, uh, evaluations for things like gifted eligibility in the public school system, um, as well as other behavioral issues that a child might be experiencing. Um, so that's about half of my practice. And then the other half is the work that's more in the forensic field. Um, so it's related to family law matters. Um, I do what's called parenting coordination, which is um, working with high conflict parents um, who um, are either divorced or perhaps they were never married, but they have a child together or children and they're struggling with co-parenting. Um, so they have difficulty communicating with each other and making decisions together. Um, so a parenting coordinator is appointed through the court um, to work with the two parents and um, with the main goal being um, reducing conflicts so that the children um, are not subjected to conflict between their parents. So if we can help parents um, co-parent better and communicate more effectively, um, it ends up helping the children in the end uh, because we know that um, it's not so much a divorce that can um, negatively impact a child. It's a high conflict divorce or separation. So it's that high conflict piece that really makes a big difference in um, how the children adjust, you know, to a new life and to homes. They can um, fare quite well if the parents um, co-parent well, but they're often at risk for experiencing a lot of different emotional and behavioral issues if the parents are not able to co-parent effectively. So um, that's really the job of a parenting coordinator. I also do um, what's called guardian ad litem work. Um, that's when you're appointed through the court to represent the best interests of the child or children in the family. I'm there to represent to the court what I think is their, in their best interest. I do an investigation. Uh, it takes several months. I'm interviewing family members, neighbors, friends, teachers, Anybody who can give me information about the family, of course, I'm meeting with the child several times as well. Um, and then I'm putting together a report of what I think is best for the children um, in terms of their schedule with each of their parents. I also do social investigations, which again is, is similar to being a guardian ad litem in the way that you're appointed through the court to again, do an investigation, talk to all the collateral sources that I mentioned you know, talk with the parents, talk with the children, um, review documentation. Um, sometimes there's some testing that's done either with the parents or the children to get a better understanding of, you know, how they're functioning and if there's certain 
personality traits or behavioral or emotional issues that could be, you know, impacting the functioning of the family. And then again, a report is put together with recommendations of what is, um, what I believe is best for the children. So in those two capacities, you know, as a social investigator and a guardian ad litem, um, you're, you're really trying to provide as much information as you can about the family. And sometimes, you know, the attorneys are able to use that information and these families can move out of the court system. Other times the parents aren't able to agree. And so in those cases, the case would go to a hearing or a trial and I would need to testify in court as to what my recommendations were. And then, of course, the judge would make the final decision. Wow. <clears throat> what a dynamic uh, set of skills and objectives for a work day for you. And so, you know, as interesting as the school psychology component is, I think it would be important for our listeners today and for us to focus on the other half of your practice, Terry. And so it looks like you're sort of alternating through these various roles of parent coordinator, guardian ad litem representative, and a social investigator. Um, so I'm curious when you're working with when you're working with families. You mentioned uh, high conflict divorce cases. How would you define or conceptualize a high conflict divorce situation? What does that look like? So a high conflict um, family is going to be one where um, they're really ingrained in a pattern of um, conflict that's been going on for some time. Um, usually when parents separate or divorce, you know, it's to be expected that there's a lot of, um, you know, hurt feelings. Maybe there was an affair, maybe there were, you know, other things that happened that were very traumatic. And, and so, um, it's quite normal to feel angry and, and resentment and hurt, but typically within a year or so, people are able to move past some of those feelings and start moving in a more positive direction and, and letting go of, of some of the hurt and the pain. Um, typically what we see with parents that are still in high conflict is that one or both of them, you know, just has not been able to move forward in that continuum. You know, that's, that's of course why we always recommend that, um, that parents get therapy, even if it's for a relatively short period of time, to kind of um, heal and learn some coping skills to deal with, you know, all of this, these changes in their life, because we know that, you know, separation or divorce with children is one of the most stressful experiences that a family can go through. So, um, you know, if parents don't get that help or for whatever reason, just aren't able to move through some of those stages, it's very much like a stage of, of grief that we see when, when there's a death, you know, or loss in the family. Um, because it's a, you know, it is a death of, of a dream that you had for your family and your life. So, so what happens is people just get so ingrained in, in this conflict and, and one or both of them can't seem to move forward. You know, it just makes it difficult to, to um, move into a more lower conflict situation. Um, we also find that sometimes, you know, there may be other issues at play. Um, as I said, there may have been infidelity. There may be a new person that's in your, you know, your former significant other's life. There's a lot of different factors. Um, there are personality characteristics that can um, play a part in parents being able to move from high conflict to a more, you know, low conflict cooperative parenting um, type model. Um, you know, if they have a hard time seeing things from other people's perspectives. You know, one of the things we try to do in parent coordination is there's a lot of an education piece there and trying to get parents to see how their behavior is affecting their children. You know, when they continue to be nasty to each other, for example, in front of the children at an exchange, or if they say bad things about the other parent to the child, or even if it's just nonverbal gestures and the way that they, you know, shake their head or make expressions on their face where it's obvious that the child knows that the parent doesn't like the other parent. You know, all those things obviously can hurt children. And so parents in high conflict often have a hard, hard time being able to see how their behavior is affecting the children. So that's, that's another thing that we really try to focus on in parenting coordination. Because usually if, you know, if parents know better, they'll do better. 
Um, and obviously these parents deeply love their children, um, but some just really have a hard time putting um, their children's needs in front of their own and being able to kind of compartmentalize and separate how they feel about their former spouse and, you know, truly allow their child to love and enjoy time with that other parent. And for our listeners that are um, going through something like this in the beginning stages and they're not sure what steps to take, what advice can you give them of how to get started and what to look for? Um, Well, as I mentioned, I would certainly um, recommend going to counseling. And I know that, you know, fortunately in our society, that is a lot less stigmatized than it used to be. Um, And it's becoming much more acceptable, you know, um, socially to say, I'm going to therapy um, and not be embarrassed about it or think there's something wrong with you. Um, You know, as I said a few minutes ago, it's one of the most stressful experiences anybody can go through. And you want to remember that whether you're the mother or the father, you want to be the best mother or father that you can be for your child. And if you're really struggling emotionally, um, you know, you're not um, able to be there for your child. And of course, your child's going through a lot of changes as well. um, But you have to be there and be the, the best parent that you can be to provide that emotional support for them. And if you're falling apart emotionally um, or perhaps getting into um, maybe some behaviors that are not um, healthy ways of coping um, with the stress, whether it's substance abuse or, you know, other coping skills that aren't um, healthy. Just remember that everything that you're doing, you're modeling that for your child. And so going to therapy is a positive thing that um, that you can do for self-care for yourself um, so that you can also be there for your child as they go through this process. And I think it's important for our listeners to recognize there's a lot of moving parts here with situations like this. And I think it's really important, Terry, that you mentioned that, you know, the loss of a marriage is one of the most stressful and traumatic things that a family system can go through. And I like how you framed it as a grief experience. And in that each individual parent has to learn how to cope with that loss, but then also the children has to, the children have to learn how to cope with that. And so it sounds like it's really, important for the parents to prioritize not only how the child adjusts to life post-divorce, but then the parent's own mental health throughout that process to help avoid the situation from going from a typical divorce to what we would call a high conflict case. Is that is that right? Yeah. And every child comes through the process differently. You know, even if you have three children in the same family, um, you know, there's a lot of different factors that would Um, impact how each of those three children kind of comes through this process, you know, um, could be their age, could be um, their different temperament or personality characteristics, um, you know, how well they kind of go with the flow and adapt to changes. It could be affected by their relationship with each of the parents. Um, So there's a lot of different factors that come into play where you may have one child that's struggling a lot more than the other, um, or one might be showing on the outside that they're doing pretty well, but really on the inside, there's a lot of anxiety, possibly depression. Um, So it's important to be, you know, consistently checking in with each of your children and, and not assuming that, oh, they're doing really well in school and they're doing things with their friends and everything's fine. Um, Again, there may be children who are not as affected, but you want to make sure that you're keeping an eye on, on each of them um, and, and checking in to see how they're doing because um, sometimes children don't want to show you that they're hurting. You know, maybe they feel um, guilty about the fact that they're struggling or they, they think that you have enough going on on your plate. You know, I don't need to add anything else for my mom or dad to worry about. So, um, you know, just, just be sensitive to that and, and try to keep their life you know, as normal as possible. You want to have, obviously there's changes happening and they're going to be living in two different homes and they're having different schedules and they're having to, you know, remember to bring their belongings back and forth. And those are things that we can't really do anything about, but other things that they have going on in their life, you know, as much as possible should remain the same, whether that's trying to keep them in the same school, keep them tied in with their peer group, you know, keep them involved with the sports teams that they've always played on, 
keep those relationships going with, you know, grandparents and other significant others that have always been a part, you know, of their life. Unfortunately, I see in cases where there's um, what we call parental alienation going on, one parent will kind of cut the other parent's family out of the child's life. Um, And so, you know, they grew up with cousins and uncles and aunts and grandparents, and now those people have been kind of cut out as a way of, of hurting um, the other parent. And of course, that's only hurting the child. So uh, we want to keep as many things, you know, stable and consistent in their life. You know, they didn't ask to be brought into this situation. And so, you know, our job as parents is to try to make it, keep it as, as consistent and normal as, as possible. Security and stability is the, the best thing that they could focus on for the children. What coping tips can you give for parents um, to use for their children to feel, you know, safe and give them an outlet during this time? Um, Well, in addition, obviously, to doing something like um, individual therapy for the child, um, there are a lot of um, great books out there that um, that kids can read that are on their level. Um, Some schools have like group therapy or support groups for kids that are going through divorce. Um, A lot of kids feel like they're the only one, Um, you know, especially I think like elementary school kids, they don't have as much experience and insight and maturity and and perhaps none of their friends' parents are divorced. So they look around and think I'm the only one and there's, you know, something wrong with me and my family. But if they participate in some of these um, divorce support groups that some of the public schools have, they see that, oh, wow, you know, this child in my class or this kid in my other class, they're going through the same thing I'm going through and I'm not alone. And that can make a really big difference to not feel so isolated. Um, Usually by the time they get into middle school and high school, you know, they've seen more of their parents, you know, divorce, their their friends' parents divorce. Um, And so it's, it doesn't, they don't quite feel as alone time and time again. It's very unfortunate that I see um, not just in my work as a parenting coordinator, but when I'm doing, you know, guardian ad litem and social investigations where, um, you know, a child has always been in ballet or karate or soccer or whatever it is, and then they separate or divorce. And one parent says, no, you can't do that anymore. Um, I'm not going to pay for it. Or, you know, your mom moved 20 minutes away and it's too far. And now all of a sudden they're fighting over these activities and months and months go by and the child hasn't been able to participate in the activity that they really need, you know, for their outlet to get their mind off of these things. Um, They probably had a peer group that was part of their team or activity and that's been taken from them. So I see a lot of that that happens with, with sports and extracurricular activities. So keeping that consistent and you know, remembering that, you know, for the most part, as much as possible, whatever we were able to provide for this child when we were together living under one roof, you know, we need to find a way, you know, if we have the financial means to provide that, those same things for the child. Yeah, that consistency and structure is is key, it sounds like, in a situation like this. Take us into the process of parent coordination. Take us into the sessions, what it might look like. You end up meeting with the parents. What is that? How does that process look? So I always start off meeting with each parent alone. Um, I go through, you know, what parent coordination is and explain to them um, what they can expect um, in the process. And I meet with them each alone so that they can kind of give me um, their perspective on what happened in the relationship. Um, because, you know, they don't know me. This is the first time they're talking to me and they want to tell me their story. You know, oftentimes they want to tell me how bad the other parent is and how much they were hurt or abused or mistreated, but it's important for me to know how they're feeling about that relationship. And so I'm not there really to determine whether any of the things that they're telling me is true. It's not an investigation to determine facts. It's basically just letting them tell me your story of how the two of y'all met, what the relationship was like, tell me some things that were positive about it. You know, in some cases they got married, in other cases they didn't, but they had children. So tell me about what 
life was like when you all were together with your child and then tell me, you know, why you decided to separate or divorce. So it's really important they can feel like they were heard and it would be very ineffective for me to try to do that with the two of them together because they would both be interrupting each other and telling me that, no, that's not how it all happened. So I usually have an hour to 90 minutes of just letting each parent tell me their story. So they, they feel like I've, I've heard everything that's happened. And then after we do that, I have meetings with them together. I usually ask them to bring um, a list of agenda items. They can email them to me beforehand. They can email each other so they know what topics they're going to be bringing up. But that way we can kind of stay focused on on agenda items that we want to resolve. It's not a therapeutic process, so it feels different, um, especially for therapists that are doing parent coordination, um, because also licensed attorneys can be parent coordinators. For them, it's, it's uh, I think, maybe a little bit of an easier transition because it's very much kind of a business meeting. Let's get down to business and figure out um, how we're going to resolve these issues. So there's some mediation skills that go into that as well. But we, you know, we address things jointly, whether it's, you know, I don't like the exchange location. Um, there's too much traffic at that time. Can we change it to a different location? Can we meet 15 minutes earlier? So it could be something, you know, fairly minor like that, or it could be, you know, I'm not happy with the school. I want to put them in a different school. And so you're trying to help them discuss these issues Sometimes you can get little things resolved fairly quickly. Something like a school issue is usually going to be more difficult, but you're not making that decision for them. You're helping um, them to talk about it and to communicate about it. Um, you might give them assignments and say, okay, you want the child to go to school A and I want the child to go to school B. Um, we're going to be meeting again next week or in two weeks. I want you to go research school A and I'll research, I'll have dad, you're going to research school B and I want you to bring the information back. And these are the factors I want you to look at um, about the school. And then we're going to talk about that when they come back. So there's some work on their part and then they, you know, you come together and share the information and um, try to see if that can help them get to a resolution. So that, that's just one example. Um, it could be which, what activities am I, is my child going to participate in? You know, the child is telling me they want to play piano and dad says, well, you know, it's too expensive. So if you want to do it, you pay for it. And so you're trying to come get them to come to an agreement about whether or not piano is something that the child should do. So um, those are just some examples of things that you hear of in parent coordination. But sometimes you have families that you meet with, um, over maybe just a few months and you're able to kind of get them, maybe they're a little bit on the lower end of the, of the high conflict spectrum and you're able to kind of get them moving in the right direction and they don't need a lot of assistance from you. Others you're going to be working with more frequently and on a longer term basis. It's going to be difficult too, because, you know, when parents are going through separation or divorce, they might not be thinking um, about their children or the family in that moment and more of like, I want to come out of this feeling like I won or something, or I'm, you know, walking away with some type of control. So for yes. you as a neutral party, you kind of have to rem remind them and encourage them to focus on the long term of like what's best for the family and the children to think about that. And it's probably difficult to get them to think about that in the moment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we talk a lot about, like you said, it's not about a, a win lose um, situation. And that's, that's the court system, unfortunately, is very adversarial. And, you know, this is an alternative dispute process. So we want to get them out of the court system, just like family mediation is an alternative dispute resolution process. Parenting coordination is the same way. I mean, you're ordered to that because the judges don't want to hear about you being 15 minutes late to the exchange location. So um, they want you to work with somebody who can help you resolve those things so you're not having to file motions with the court and spending all this money on attorneys, you know, when those are resources that should be reserved for your family and 
perhaps your children's college or, or whatever it is. So, but yeah, getting them to understand that it's not about winning. It's not about control. A lot of it is about giving in and compromising and realizing you're not always going to get what you want, which is hard. Picking your battles, all those types of things that, you know, if you can show the other parent that, okay, I'm going to kind of concede on this. The hope is they're going to concede on something at some point. But again, a lot of them are, are used to being entrenched in conflict. Um, there are some that actually like that engagement, even though it's negative. Um, it keeps them engaged with the other parent, um, especially if they're having a hard time letting go. Um, so there's so many different reasons why. And a lot of times I'll, because it's not a therapeutic process, I mean, it's good to have that understanding as a mental health professional, but you're not there to give them therapy. So a lot of times you're recommending, hey, mom, I really think, you know, that you would benefit from working with an individual therapist while we're going through this process. And of course, you know, you want to say that in a way that's not going to make them feel um, judged or criticized. Uh, maybe you're asking both of them to go work with an individual therapist. Um, because if they don't work on some of those issues, it's going to be really hard to move forward in the parenting coordination process. And the effects of that are obviously long-term and devastating. And I think this is a good segue for us to go into your work as a guardian ad litem and social investigator, Terry. Tell us about some of the things that you see and that you're appointed by the courts to work with, with kids and families. Um, you know, in what instances may you be appointed to work with some of these cases? Fortunately, I think that the statistic is like 90% of divorces, um, you know, parents with children are able to work out their own parenting plan, whether they do it with each other or they go to mediation, um, or maybe they hire attorneys just to write up the parenting plan. And then it's, you know, filed with the court and they move on. So about 10% are not able to do that. So not all of those cases, the 10% are going to, um, have a guardian ad litem or social investigator. Um, however, if a judge hears things when they do have hearings um, that are of concern um, about the child, oftentimes they will appoint a guardian ad litem or a social investigator. Um, they know that, you know, dad's attorney is coming in and, and saying X and mom's attorney is coming in and saying Y. And, and those positions are so completely different and they're advocating for their client, but the judge doesn't really know where the truth is. So they want a neutral person to get in there and do an investigation. But there's usually always some kind of allegation. So it could be, you know, my child has been refusing to come over to my house during my time sharing. And it's because you're talking badly about me and putting things in his head. And so that would be, you know, a form of parental alienation. Now my kid hasn't come over. So a lot of these are cases that they've post-divorce. So it could be years and years have gone by. And there's been a lot of problems in the family. And so um, they're asking the court to do something. So I, I had a case I just started the other day where dad hasn't seen his daughter in like five years. So she's just refused to come over and he's blaming the mother and the mother saying, no, it's because you were abusive. And so my job is to get in there and determine was really there as best as I can. Was there any abuse? You know, what behaviors you know, our mom is mom exhibiting to help facilitate and encourage a relationship with dad. So we have these 20 factors that the court looks at. And, and num the number one factor that I think the court weighs heavily, most heavily on is um, how does the other parent encourage and facilitate a relationship with the other parent? So are they saying, yes, it's your time to go to your dad's this weekend, get in the car, let's go. Or are they saying, oh, I know he's a jerk and he abused you. So you don't have to go. I'm not going to make you go. Um, and there's a lot of variations of that. But when we have children who are resisting or refusing contact, um, when there's allegations of substance abuse, when there are, when there's a parent that's um, had a lot of issues with the criminal justice system, usually those are pretty cut and dry because, you know, if they've got a long history of jail time and things, we're just looking at how much does that impact the child. You know, how long ago was it and how, how, how does that impact their parenting today? 
you'll have a lot of cases where there have been DCF calls, but nothing's been founded. Unfortunately, a lot of alle- false allegations. So those are really, you know, obviously sensitive issues and, and sticky situations. But in most cases, they've already been investigated by the police and by DCF. Um, so you're looking to see, is this a parent that is you know, making false allegations in order to um, prevent the, the parent from, the other parent from seeing the child. And then you are tasked at that point. So in these instances, in this role of guardian ad litem and social investigator, and I know there's some overlaps, but there's also some differences. You're then tasked with what specifically? Um, determining if there's any Um, truth to the allegations, and there's usually allegations on both sides. Both parents are alleging something. Um, So you're really trying to get down to the facts about whether or not there's any evidence. And again, you're talking to lots of different people, reviewing lots of documents. Um, Could be police reports, DCF reports, you know, in a case of sexual allegations, a lot of times that parent will have to have what they call a psychosexual evaluation. You know, did that show that this parent demonstrates any behaviors of somebody that would, um, you know, abuse a child? Um, So there's lots of different things that you're going to look at to see if you can um, determine whether there's any validity to any of these allegations. And then um, analyzing those 20 factors that the state comes up with um, that we have to uh, assess as part of um, what's in a child's best interest and then finally making those recommendations to the court. And um, if it's a case where a parent, let's say, has made a lot of fa- false allegations and turned a child against um, the other parent, um, that's a situation where that parent may risk losing time sharing um, with their child because of th- that type of behavior. So each case is different and you have to kind of analyze all of that information and then make recommendations of what do you think is going to be best um, not only for the child's, you know, mental health and emotional well-being, but also for their relationship with each of their parents. What's a typical length of time that you work with? The, I know they all differ, but what's on average, um, how long are you working with the, the family? For a guardian ad litem or social investigation case, it, it obviously does depend on how complicated it is how many years this has been going on. I mean, I've had parents that come in with binders and binders of information because somebody's called DCF 20 times. So it's very, very complicated. Um, I would say, you know, I always tell parents my goal is to get it wrapped up in about 120 days. So four months. I've had some really simple cases that probably really didn't need a social investigation that I've gotten done in like um, 90 days. I've had others that have taken a lot longer than that. Some of it depends on how willing the parents are, you know, to, to cooperate with coming in for appointments and, and not canceling, um, paying their fees that they need to pay for the investigation. So some of that can can delay the completion. But, you know, the goal is to try to get it to do a comprehensive job so it can't be done too quickly. But, you know, four or five months to really do a comprehensive job so that the case can keep moving forward towards resolution. Um, but unfortunately, in some situations, it can take a lot longer than that. So a very extensive process. But as you noted, this is really associated with, with the child's well-being and the overall cis family system. Um, Terry, thank you so much for going over all of these uh, specific services that you provide. I think it's very important for our listeners because we know that divorce is, uh, you know, is a situation that a lot of people go through. And I think a lot of the general population is not aware of some of these uh, some of these services. So thank you so much for explaining all of this. Oh, you're very welcome. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you so much. I feel like we can talk to you all day about this. You're so well versed and you have so many like different dynamics that you work with. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna put a lot of the resources that you mentioned and even some books and for our listeners, I think that's really important, all the stuff that you mentioned and where they can find you and what they can do if they're in this situation. Um, So again, thank you so much um, for spending the time with us. Wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you to our listeners for spending time with us today, and we will see you next time. 
Thank you so much for joining us here today on the Counseling Podcast with Dr. Jacqueline and Dr. Stokes. Please take this time to thank yourself for putting in the work. If this episode impacted you in any way, let us know with a loving and honest review. If you have any questions or want to continue the conversation from today, you can reach out to us at thecounselingpodcast at gmail.com and we can answer your questions right here on the show. Or you can find Dr. Jacqueline and Dr. Stokes on Instagram at docjacqueline and at Dr. Jeremiah.stokes.